<clears throat> Thank you for that beautiful song, which uh, that song, along with the, uh, the fact that Mary had roses today, not always, they're not always roses, is really wonderful. So I, I dedicated the song and that to my friend, Reverend Cheryl Rose, because I was unable to get to the service on Friday at, in <clears throat> Los Angeles at Agape. So Spirit took care of that for me by having that beautiful song, and uh, thank you. God breathes, and I'm so glad it does. Because it breathes as you and me and all of us, near and far. So we're continuing with the munch, month of, munch of March. <laughs> I'll get back. I'll find my body eventually. <clears throat> month of March on callings. And it is inspired by the book which to me in 1999 was a seminal book, Callings, Finding and Following an Authentic Life, written by Greg Lavoie. And I wanted to start with this book for March because as you may have heard on the announcements in PowerPoint, I am so grateful and excited that he's coming and he'll be here next month to talk about his new book. I mean, it's been since 1999, and he didn't write another one, and this one, <laughs> Vital Signs. So we're going to talk about callings before we talk about vital signs, but basically it's really all the same thing, finding and following an authentic life, tapping into your passion and your purpose. And um, this is a, a, a great condition, but a remainder book that'll be in our bookstore when I finish using it as a prop today. So if you want to want to buy it, it's there. It's wonderful. And how perfect was it that uh, when Reverend Kathy and I spoke months ago, when knowing what was going on for her, and we were trying to find a Sunday where she could be here, and I said, well, the theme is callings, and it was perfect for her. So I want to thank her for um, not only the talk last week, but also for her that part of her that listened to her call and said yes to that. So I'm acknowledging her for that. As we move forward, today's talk is titled, Psst, Hey You. <laughs> it's going to look funny on the title thing, I know, but psst. the reason why is, and why I chose that wonderful Nelson Eddy Jeanette McDonald song, When I'm Calling You, because it's about God calling you and trying to get your attention. You know, Psst, Hey You. Wake up, pay attention, because your life is calling you. God is calling you, and many of us along the journey, the dust and grit of the journey called life with a capital L, we sometimes forget that. We lose that, and some of us even deftly bury that. We take the calling, the passion, that which speaks to us, and we go, uh, I don't know if anybody's going to understand that. I don't know if, it's, I, I, if they're going to like it. I don't know if it's going to be popular, so I'm just going to put it in this box, close the lid, put a lock on it, put it in my closet, and close the door. <laughs> Has anyone else ever done that? <laughs> yep. So the idea being, as we move through the weeks this month, is to return to an opportunity to find what we can do to resurrect, Easter's coming next month, our calling. Now, many of us think about a calling, you know, you think about the calling, you've always heard people are called to the ministry. They're called to being a physician, you know, the higher callings. And we think that if we're not a doctor or a minister, that we don't have a calling. We might have an avocation, we might have a hobby we really like, we might have a job, but do we have a calling? And I say, yes, 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 yes. Each and every one of us has a calling. And it is our opportunity, no matter whether we're six or 60, to find out, to reveal what that is. Because I guarantee you that if you do not answer that call, if you keep putting it on hold, if you do not allow that call to reveal itself through you, you will pay a price for that. I'm not going to try to define, because each person's price, air quotes, is going to be different. But in the Bible, in Eastern traditions, in, well, filled in Mr. Lavoie's book, are all these reasons and, and explanations why you can't ignore it. Now, the, the difference may be the calling that you had as a little one may have morphed into something different as you have gotten older. 
And that's okay if you're answering it, if you're paying attention to it. It's uh, allowed to, you know, update, to change your calling. But what I want to encourage is that we don't have the thing where you go, oh, hi, God. Yeah, it's me. Oh, I got to run. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm getting another call. I, you put, on, put God on hold. Because that's what you do when you don't say yes to your passion, to your authentic life, to who you are. And too many of us have done that on and off for many years along the way. So the, the book Callings, Greg Lavoie, not only is a wonderful writer and inspiration, he has a thing about words. Huh, I wonder why I like that. And he always uses the roots of words to explain things. And he talked about religion in the original sense of the word from the Latin religare, which is to reconnect, to remember what has been dismembered. Get that? Here we are, Church of Religious Science. And even though we teach and preach that we have a philosophy, not a religion, because we don't want to be confused with other uh, traditional religions, if we go with the root word, it's truth, religare, it's really about us reconnecting and remembering who we are individually and as a community, following our religion of authenticity, following our purpose as a community. And I thought, that's, that's it. That's where we are. Then it goes on when William James said, described religion as the attempt to be in harmony with an unseen order of things. That's what we do. I think that's why we're called to religion. Yes, there have been times, people and religions, where you are, when one or many are called to that religion out of a certain sense of guilt or concern and fear. But mostly, we're still drawn to it because we're trying to reconnect. We're trying to uncover something that may have been buried. We are trying to remember who we are from that spark of life that created us in the beginning, in the get-go. And so the book Callings goes into really deep work about that. And now he takes it, I am working on reading through Vital Signs so that I'm ready for April. And, and Vital Signs is about this big. And I, I was going to tell Mr. Lavoie when he gets here, if I had two copies, then I could, you know, re I could, it could be, it'd be really good because then I'd have an authentic, I'd be authentically buff in addition to finding my place and purpose. So he will be here. It's a, we're lucky to get him. He'll be here on Monday, the 27th. It's an evening thing, seven o'clock. So pencil that in. It's really not to be missed. So a calling as I said, most of us think of a calling as some really lofty thing that if we're not called to it, oh well, we're you know, pedestrian and plebeians and we just will follow our little way. And no, the calling comes to us every day. Every day. If we start with the simplified yet so powerful idea that the calling is really to be our authentic selves, fully present and here for God. Everybody's got that calling. Everybody, I don't care of your age, I don't care if you're retired, everyone has that calling. And then it's about finding methods, whether it's reading the book or coming to a, a, a Sunday service or a class, to find ways by which you reveal your own unique, authentic calling of what it is you're here to do. How many of us, at, certainly at least in pubescent or prepubescent time, thought, why, why am I here? Who am I? What am I about? I believe that all of us have, thank you, I only have Polly and John. <laughs> They're the only two, uh, there's the three of us, we're good. <laughs> the, the trinity that we've created, we're the only ones who said, who am I and why am I here? I, I kind of still believe that most of you have thought that at somewhere <laughs> around your lives about your work, about choosing your spouse, your, your, where you live, or where you move to. And sometimes a calling is more than just an avocation or a job. Sometimes the calling is to, you know, do something like uh, move, or uh, get a new job, um, start dating again, uh, clean out the garage so that there's order. A calling can be, a, I'm going to, for my sake, I'm going to make the differentiation. It can be a C, lowercase c. And sometimes there is the dun, 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 capital C calling. I don't want you to ignore either of them because usually the little C callings get you to the greater C calling of what it is you're here to do. And I know that some of you are retired. I know that. And I also know that you still have a calling. 
And I'm trusting and knowing that some of you are answering that call whether it's about a creative expression, whether it's about being of service, that's a call to do for someone else, seva, we talk about seva every so often here, being of a higher service to yourself, the community, every single volunteer here is, is answering that call to service. I mean the people, Lynn is always in the, in the foyer with her ambassador team doing that. Robin and Linda George are here, uh, Polly and I think they live here. I, I really think they have a secret, he built a secret room for them back here because they're here all the time. And you know, I can say it ad nauseum, our new AV team, all the people who serve the books are, uh, it's that dangerous thing. If I start listing people, then I forget someone. I don't want to do that. Uh, and you know, since I didn't get the opportunity to do that at the Academy or the Tony or the Emmy Awards, I don't want to do that here. But I don't, it, it's really about being aware of each of us as servants. Servants. Servant usually has a bad connotation. But when I was at Agape with Dr. Michael, um, when I was training there and going to ministerial school, et cetera, et cetera, he once said to his practitioners and ministers that he wanted to have above the entranceway or his office a sign that said, Servants Entrance. <laughs> See, and when you think about it for a moment, because we are here to serve to serve our higher selves and our calling, to serve one another in a community where we are relegarying, I don't think that's a word, but Webster's not alive to catch me. We are being here in service, of service to one another as a community of God. So the idea of servant's entrance makes perfect sense to me because when you come here, you're serving. Whether it's because today you're serving by, you know, fixing cookies or handing programs or videotaping, you're serving in that way, or you're serving because you are here to be so open and receptive and mindful that the greater idea of God has to know of itself through you and as you. To be service of, to spirit that way, that takes a commitment that takes courage and that's what this book is about the call when you get a call that's only a monologue that means it's individual and singular but when you get the answer to your call that's when a dialogue takes place that's when you become in oneness so it, it doesn't mean anything if you get a call you know what it's like, you, particularly earlier days when cell phones, you didn't have really good, and you'd go, hello, hello, and you, and, and, you know, and you knew someone was on the line, but you couldn't communicate. It wasn't a conversation because something technically was wrong. Well, it's the same thing. If you're hearing your call is to go out and dance, and you're going, yeah, well, I don't know, I'm too old. Uh, yeah, I didn't have lessons. Um, well, there's not enough classes here. Blah, blah, blah. You're hearing that call, and you and you don't answer it, it's kind of like talking to that static phone. Hello, hello, uh, did you say prance? What, I, what, what do you want me to do? Eh, never mind. We must answer the calls that we receive. We must listen, and that's the next key thing. How do we know if we're getting calls? If there's so much cacophony and static going on in our heads, in the world around us, that is why we have and we teach these ideas of contemplation, meditation, stillness, and silence. And most of us, at least initially, are really uncomfortable with that idea of silence, aren't we? You know why? First of all, we're not conditioned to it. We have so much noise and so much going on everywhere with the ticker tapes. And, and if you're on television, there's, there's, there's like a screen here, a screen here, a ticker tape here, and audio here. It's like, blah, blah, blah. so it's a little hard to do that, which is why I love the fact that we have a spiritual community. So you come here and you are trained and reminded and supported and encouraged to find those times of stillness and silence, whether you're doing transcendental meditation or you're doing a Buddhist meditation or you're just doing our simple contemplation together, getting to the place of silence so that all the other sounds filter away and down and you might actually have the courage and the ability to hear that still small voice within you that says, psst, hey you. Usually it talks nicer than that though. It doesn't sound like a bully on the street corner. It usually is, ah, Duchess, there you are. I've been waiting for you. 
And sometimes there are little hearts flutter and it's like, oh yes, 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 spirit, tell me, tell me, tell me what you will have me do, show me where you will have me go. <sighs> tell me what you will have me say, oh, all these things. And other times the spirit says that and you go, uh, I don't think I want to know that because if you really tell me what I'm thinking, what I want to know, what I'm passionate about, and what I think I should be doing, then I'd have to change my life, so never mind. La, 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 la. Kids did that, right? I mean, those of you, kids like to do that. When they don't want to hear you say something, <coughs> la, 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 la. And that's the image I get when you're sitting in meditation, contemplation or stillness, and you're there, and it's lovely, and you've just blessed your family and your community, and blah, 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 and the still small voice goes, ah, there you are. Let's talk. La, 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 la. Sorry, God. Gotta go. My plea to you, the basis of Mr. Lavoie's two books, is you must take your hands off your ears, start, stop doing that, and start to listen to your call. To have the courage to know what it is that you're being called to do. It may be simple, don't get nervous, it doesn't mean you have to go out and find the next new mm, giant thing. Uh, people are doing that all the time. Your call may be simply to show up, but to show up mindfully to show up being present. Robert Holden writes, your happiness contributes so much more to the world than your suffering. Uh, ooh. I shall read that again, that had an effect. Your happiness contributes so much more to the world than your suffering. And, I, and it, suffering doesn't always have to be the big, giant, you know, drama suffering. But when we're not saying yes to who we are, what we want in life, our passions, we're suffering inside, even though we may have a great little smile on the outside. Hey, we're doing fine. Life is good, isn't it? Yeah. And inside, you know, you want to be saying, doing, being something else. That's where the suffering comes in. Because you compensate for it. And you function pretty well. Yesterday, I had a, a, a different way, a, a new appreciation. I'm working with a new... I always forget it. Is it masseuse if it's a guy or masseur? It's a guy, massage therapist, physical therapist. Masseuse? Masseur? Him. A massage guy. <laughs> Who's a, he uh, is also physical therapy. Anyway, I, I'm going there because I'm trying to change. Um, Al Rate, see, you love stories, Al. I, I have an old dance injury <laughs> in my leg that keeps flaring up. It's been. 20 years or more, and every time I try and get on a, you know, a fitness program, <laughs> then it flares up, and then I'm down for four to six weeks again, and I try again, and it's this, this seesaw, which I'm really tired of having. So we're trying to work on fixing the muscles, the structure, and healing, right? So yesterday we're working on it, and I said, oh, the right leg just flared up. I went to the track, I went to yoga, and it, blah, blah, blah. And, I, and then he's working on it, and my left leg was the one screaming as he was touching it, you know, and doing all this stuff, and I went, wow, what's with my left leg? The left leg isn't the one that was having the problem. It's the right leg that had the problem and was swollen. And he said, well, the left leg has been compensating for the pain. Well, that hit me. It just, and I realized, I said, oh, I need to apologize to my left side, <laughs> my left leg. And he, he, I don't think he understood where I, what I meant by that, but... <laughs> That was okay, he, you know, and, and, I, and then I realized as I was driving home and I was thinking about that, that it's the same thing. That when we have a hurt or we're suffering because we're not doing what we want to do, we're not answering the call, we find a way, because we're so resilient and so intelligent, we find a way to compensate. And we have things that we do and we look fine and everything's going on, but that compensation is creating a different pain. And so I thought of my simple little muscle swapperoo there as, oh my gosh, that's what we do, I do, mm -hmm. I won't speak for you, what I do in life when I'm not paying attention to that which needs my attention, and then part of me starts to suffer, and then the other part of me starts to compensate and adapt. Ugh. I'm not sure I like the idea of adapting. I'm, I'm playing with that word these, this week because I don't know how I feel about that. There's a value I know to adapting. One needs to, but not at 
the cost of what's authentic and true. In the book, Mr. Lavoie talked about, it gave an example from the Quaker tradition that I really liked. Because if you're wrestling with what is my call, or how do I find it, or how do I enact it, et cetera, et cetera, and you're really unsure, or you, or you get the answer to your call and it means a complete turnover, upside down, you know, thing for your life, how do you proceed? So the Quakers have something called clearness committees. I don't, hmm, okay, I'll read that. And what they do is if there is a Quaker member in the community who's having an issue, needs clarity on something, whatever it is, body, work, relationships, whatever it is, that member um, submits a synopsis of what the issue is that's going on for them. And then the clearness committee reads that, gets prepared, and then comes together and meets with the member that's, that's in question. And the first thing that they do is they sit in silence together. Silence. Silence. And the reason that they do that is because intuitively, I don't think anybody wrote this down, intuitively they know that they don't want the ego mind, the you know, ob objective mind, the brain, the linear stuff to start coming in and, and looking at the members' issues going, oh, well, all you need to do is this, this, and this. Have you tried this, this, and this? No, they move their human selves out of the way to allow for a greater expression and there's only one simple rule in the clearness committee process. You can only ask questions. You don't get to say, well, what I did when I was your age, or have you tried? You ask the member questions. And as a result of that, the member who is having this clarity issue gets to hear things differently, gets feedback, and begins to question and understand from their, themselves, their higher self, the answer. So this committee, this community, these people of a different religion come together to support one another in this idea of bringing, oops, excuse me, the transpersonal towards bringing the individual dilemma into the divine. And Quaker Douglas Steer defines the value of silence by listening to each other's souls into disclosure and discovery. Sometimes we're just so busy doing that we get to be too busy to be feeling and then we get confused and we need clarity about our goals, our call, our actions. And so maybe we need a clearness committee. And in some ways that's what our practitioners do with you. When you sit and you talk and no matter what your story is, we're knowing, holding, seeing the absolute truth of your, your being. We don't sit there and go, oh really, have you upped your vitamin C? You know, uh, oh, must be allergy season, so go to That's not what we do. We see the wholeness in you. And so in some ways, having a session with the, with the practitioners like a clearness committee, and I'm thinking we could create clearness committees, or you y'all could create your own clearness committee, just where someone is sitting with you, loves you enough to not try and fix you, to just be with you in the silence, know the wholeness of your being, and then just ask questions and let you individually respond to the call. Wow. A clearness committee. Some of you, I don't know about you, but when we picked our um, essences at Christmas Eve, one of the ones I got was clarity. I went, ha, ha. Maybe I need a clearness committee. So if you're unclear about your calling, your place, your purpose, your passion, you need to rekindle that. Perhaps you need to identify those things in your life that mean something to you. I know I've said this umpteen times years ago and in and out, that when Ray Bradbury came to San Diego and spoke, one, the one thing, one of the many things that stayed with me was he talked about, if you're kind of in a cloud, go back to your original passions what you loved as a kid, there's a clue in there somewhere. It may still be, I doubt I'm going to be a ballerina these days, you know? <coughs> Just probably not going to happen. But there's something about that desire in me that wanted to be a ballerina that might inform me of where my passions are today. 
So go back to that. And if you can't or you think, well, I don't know, I have another, I have a little process I'm going to put you through. That sounds really awful, doesn't it? I'm going to put you through a process. <laughs> Oh, the power one wields. Uh, so, yes, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through this little, little process and then we're going to stay with our eyes closed and then I'll, I'll wrap it up in prayer. I think that's the best way to do it because this is deep and it's, it might be the kind of thing that you want to take home and do. So just if it starts to poke at you and it feels uncomfortable, you feel a little queasy about it or something, just listen to it. You don't have to do it today. Listen to it so that you can recreate it at home. So I'd like you to just put things down, get comfortable, sit in those not comfortable seats. <laughs> not yet, at least, and you get the other ones. And this, this exercise is basically inspired by the author Dina Metzger, who wrote a book, Writing for Your Life. So get comfortable, close your eyes, breathe. This exercise is to help you identify your passions and the actions that constitute the emotional core underneath those passions so you know how to direct your sail, where to put your antenna. <sighs> Suddenly there's a knock at your door. A beloved and trusted friend enters to warn you that the dream police will arrive in 20 minutes. Breathe. Everything, and I mean everything in your life that you have not written down will disappear once they arrive. You have only 20 minutes to preserve what is most precious in your life. Those ideas, memories, people, or things that have formed who you are. Now, we're not doing the 20 minutes together. I just want you to have the exercise to open this up, create a post-it note in your brain to do this. So when they arrive, anything that is essential to you must be retained. Anything that you cannot live without, you need to identify. Because whatever you don't identify, you will forget and it will disappear. Everything that is to be saved needs to be named in its particularness, its uniqueness. And by that I mean, if you say, oh, I always want to remember trees, don't just say I want to remember trees, oak trees, pine trees, and smell them. Get the visceral qualities, all your senses working. If you say, oh, I love animals, I couldn't live my life without animals, and I couldn't, then say dogs or cats or elephants and, and dolphins, what, be specific. You have 20 minutes. And you don't get to be general and just say, all animals, all books. That would be hard. I'd probably use 18.5 minutes of my 20 minutes listing the books. And if it's people or friends, don't just say, oh, all my friends. Name them. Jesse. Kelly. The things that mean the most to you, specify them. Because when you do, you're getting in touch with your passions, and it may be an obvious passion, or you may need to look within that to define the core essence of what is your calling, what is your passion, what is your authentic self, whether it's painting or writing or social action or, or just being of service or love, baking, you get to identify it and it's uniquely yours. So keep your eyes closed and take another breath. And know that this exercise is there for you to examine in the safety and comfort of your home when you are courageous enough to be still and quiet. And you might want to have a pad with you to write them down. Because when you emerge from this contemplation, you might want to look at what's really important to you. Some of the items on that list may be obvious almost didn't need to even mention, and some might surprise you. 
So wrap up this exercise, fold it over in a little piece of paper, make origami out of it and put it inside the pocket of your heart or your mind, whatever you prefer, and then breathe and be still and neutral for a moment. Joseph Campbell used to hint or said that those things that are part of our passion or our calling, those we have experiences every day that hint at what we're hungry for. This is one way to identify that. And so now we breathe together and we're going to do a spiritual mind treatment. And for those who are new, a spiritual mind treatment is just a five-step affirmative prayer, much like the song we sang. Speaking from the one mind, affirming and declaring our good, not supplicating, begging, pleading for it, but knowing it's already ours. And so I speak this spiritual mind treatment in the first person so that you can say it along with me in your head or just simply receive it. I know that there is one life. I affirm that there is one life. I am grateful that there is one life and that life is God and that life is perfect and that is my life now. All of the perfection of the universe, the stars, the trees, the animals, the oceans, oh, that is God, that is me. I am one with the smiles of a brand new puppy or a baby or a bright, shiny new car. All of those wonderful things that we can identify in the external world. I am one with all of that and more. And so now that I know I'm one with that grand life of God and that there is a power in the universe that is greater than anything I can imagine, I choose to use it. I choose to declare from that knowingness and that wholeness that life is good in this instant, right here, right now. And that as I speak my word, everything is added unto me because I am knowing and declaring that truth, whether it is really health and vitality that I'm seeking, whether it is clarity and creativity and purpose, whether it is abundance, prosperity, peace of mind, loving relationships, all of that is mine. So then the rest of my prayer is about releasing, dissolving anything that is not those things, anything that stands in the way of me knowing my passion, anything that I want to inscribe on the walls of my heart that I want to keep forever and allow those to continue to motivate and inspire me, my passion, my calling, my purpose. And as I know this for myself, I know that it is possible for any and everyone, for we are all one together, whether it is a member of this church community or the greater church of God that expands beyond these walls. I breathe that in. And I know that together, with a like mind of spirit, that we come together to know this truth, to share, and to be each other's clearness committee, each other's loving, safe space, wherever you are on your spiritual journey, you are welcome, you are safe, you are loved. I accept all of that. I embrace all of that, and I know that whatever it is I need personally, humanly, emotionally, physically, to know that and be that in my life on a daily basis, I embrace willingly. Thank you, spirit. Thank you, life. Thank you. I am so glad that this is true, that I may now just take it all, whew, release it, let it go, so that I may be fully present, mindful, available, right here, right now, in the goodness of this moment. I lovingly let it be. Please join me as together we say, and so, and so I am, and so we are. Amen. Yes, thank you. Hmm. It's at this time that we do our offering. How we do it, we have a song that we sing while it's taking place. There's lyrics coming up. John's going to guide us. 
But the idea, particularly if you're new, is to just be here, present, with your gift, your calling, or your giving. Just be with it. And when the basket comes by, uh, bless it. And 